Okay, hello everyone. Sorry for taking so long. We had some um, technical difficulties. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And um, I see we've got some questions coming through. So really excited to be here today. Another webinar. Uh, today we're going to get into sales and sales development. Um, so keep your questions coming. So what are we covering today? We are covering um, some core themes around building a strong professional brand, owning your calendar, so how you can be more productive, um, what days, weeks, months, and quarters matter, and then how to lead and develop an inspired team. Um, how do you eliminate burnout and uh, how do you drive peak performance? And I know that for some of you early stage guys, it's really, really important um, to be able to figure out how you can figure your sales team, how you can motivate them, and I guess how you sort of get them excited about facing rejection, which is something that we all all have. Um, so really excited that you could join us today, Ralph. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank and um, I guess, do you want to explain a little bit about yourself? So I met Ralph at a sales hacker um, conference, interviewed him, asked him a whole lot of questions, and um, he's a great guy and uh, very knowledgeable about sales. So over to you. Hello, Sean, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today and dealing with the uh, technical, uh, technical difficulties that we had. It's, it's great to be here. My name is Ralph Barcy. I am currently the senior director of our sales development organization at ServiceNow. I am based in Santa Clara, California, right in the heart of Silicon Valley, and I oversee the top of the funnel organization. So all the sales development representatives who are on the phones and sending emails and following up to the inbound leads that are received from our marketing engine, as well as all the outbound prospecting efforts that are done to uh, engage our marketplace uh, is the team that I uh, oversee. There are over a hundred folks in my organization based in seven different cities. Uh, the closest to New Zealand uh, we, is we have an office in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we're also in Singapore and in Tokyo covering APJ out of those three cities. And then we have two in the US and we have two in Europe. And uh, my expertise and specialty really centers on sales development and that top of the funnel effort. Uh, I've been in sales for close to 23 years now. Over half of my career has been spent as an individual contributor where I've carried a bag, carried a quota, and I've uh, been responsible for a territory. Uh, but the latter half of my career is really focused on building and scaling sales development organizations. And it's uh, turned out to be a real passion of mine. So I'm happy to, to speak about it at any opportunity. Awesome. That is, that is great. Um, how, what's the biggest sale you've ever made? Uh, it was just over a million dollars. It was to a healthcare system and I sold uh, billing software. So I helped the uh, healthcare system uh, send out accounts, uh, accounts payable and do remittance on accounts receivable. And worst sale you've ever made? Oh, well, the worst sale I ever made wasn't made. And uh, very early in my career, Sean, I walked into, uh, I was selling websites to companies. It was the late nineties. A lot of businesses did not have a web presence. And I walked into a, a kitchenware store in Oakland, California. And I walked right to the back where the owner was and started to pitch them on uh, the value of having a presence on the web. And they ended up literally walking me out to the sidewalk out in, in front of the store and uh, told me to get lost. So I didn't make that sale. And it was one of the worst one of the worst times, but you try to spin it into a positive as best you can. I bet you uh, you learned a lot from that one. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, cool. So I guess um, let's click into the into the themes that we want to explore. So how do you build a, a strong professional brand? Oh yeah, so um, so building a brand and really owning time and owning your calendar, and then obviously. Uh, embracing your passion. Those three themes, I'm not your passion, but your purpose rather, those three themes were really derived from a presentation that I did recently called Five Barriers That Block Salespeople From Hitting Quota. And just to, just to review quickly what those five barriers are, the first one is obscurity. You know, one of the toughest things that salespeople deal with is not being known in their marketplace. So obscurity is one of the, the real reasons why professionals today have to develop a personal and professional brand. It's, it's imperative, especially in sales, if they want to penetrate the marketplace, if they want to engage the right accounts with some relevancy and some value, you know, not being obscure is a, a pretty good place to start. Uh, the second barrier that I talk about is a lack of focus. 
As you know, we are overwhelmed today by the amount of information coming across the wire, whether it be here on our mobile devices or on our laptops or in email, and just really being able to shift your mindset uh, and focus heavily on what the target is that you're after, even within the next hour versus the fiscal year, uh, takes a lot of effort and energy. Uh, but it too is imperative if you, if you want to do well in your business and if you want to, as a sales rep, hit quota. Third one is um, inactivity. You know, a lot of people say they're going to do things and they don't actually do what they say they're going to do. And uh, just avoiding that, um, that mantra is, is uh, critical if you want to be successful in sales. Um, the fourth barrier is no conversation flow. A lot of people have a hard time, whether it's written or verbal, just carrying a good conversation with somebody. And what you say to the CEO of a company versus what you say to maybe a frontline rep uh, are two different things more often than not. So just having the wherewithal of knowing who your audience is and establishing a good flow of conversation is really important. And then the last barrier is uh, failure to continue improving. Uh, and that comes from a, an old quote from the late, great motivational speaker, Jim Rohn. He spelled his name R-O-H-N if you want to look him up. But he said, you know, you have to work harder on yourself than you work on your job. And that means, you know, you might want to have to turn off the television and turn off the local sports game that's on and start focusing on your profession and on mastering your craft. So when I take a look at those five barriers, I really derive uh, building your brand, owning your time and owning your calendar, and then just knowing your purpose and what it is that's really getting you out of bed every day uh, to um, get focused on. Awesome. So I think long answer to that question on brand, and I'm happy to go into brand too, if, uh, if you want, unless there's a question that's come across. You could touch on brand for a bit, I think. Um, I guess our approach to sales in New Zealand, like sales has always been a dirty word, right? And I guess Sales as a profession is really something that sort of started becoming like we've sort of been talking about it for the last two years. But in New Zealand, I don't know if sales is is a comfortable profession that people are like, yes, I'm I'm a sales professional and this is my life path and and this is what I'm going to be really doing. So I guess what have you learned from you know? So everyone, all of you guys, go to Sales Hacker. You all learn from each other. You all um, implement each other's tools like Lacey and and all of those people. Sure. So. I guess talk about that a little bit and why it's important. Yeah, it's a good it's a good segue into what Sales Hacker does. So for those of you not familiar with Sales Hacker, they're essentially a media company that focuses on sales. That's hence the name. But what Sales Hacker offers is uh, fabulous content that's really relevant to the sales world, be it uh, via an article or a webinar or a chat like the one we're doing right now, or um, a LinkedIn group on uh, networking events and conferences. It really brings together the sales community uh, where people can network and learn about each other's companies, each other's offerings and about each other and the values that each individual sales professional can really bring to the table and to the marketplace. So, um, you know, a really good way to get started with brand. And as you mentioned, Sean, just finding out whether or not sales is really a passion of yours and something that you think you can do well in, it's always best to start just by listening. And so, you know, a great way to start doing that is, you know, attending chats like the one you and I are having right now to just listening to what people are talking about in relevant LinkedIn groups. So I would highly recommend trying the inside sales experts group on LinkedIn, as well as sales hackers groups, and just logging into the search window and looking up sales groups there's so many different conversations out there. So it's really important that you quietly parachute into that community and just listen to what people are talking about. Try to identify the keywords that you're seeing come across more often than not. And if you don't know terms or terminology, go to Google and look it up and, and uh, start to self-educate. Then when you feel like you can add some value to the conversation, you make a connection with the people that you want to uh, network with or get to know better. That way, when you do chime in uh, to respond to someone's question, hopefully you've made an effort to try to get to know them or at least introduce yourself prior to making your comment. And it just makes the whole experience warmer for both parties. And then the final phase is really engaging and truly engaging that person or that person's company, for example. If you think they're a viable uh, candidate for you to, uh, to talk to as a prospect or as a suspect, uh, or it might be the you know future home of your next job in your career. So 
it's always critical to um, remember that you just, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated, be respectful, be tactful, be mindful, listen, then connect and then engage. And that's usually a good formula to use. Awesome. Um, can you also potentially touch on, I guess, the full st sales stack as well? Um, I, I don't know if um, Kiwis or if, if our businesses really look at or realize how much of a full stack sales have become from like, I guess, sales development right through to sales enablement technology and what that actually means. Like we've had the, you know, full stack developers and full stack marketers for a while. And now we've got full stack salespeople or how do you choose which part of the sales stack do you want to be in and, and what is the sales stack? Sure, absolutely. Well, that term, uh, it's relatively new. It's probably about five years old now and it's really derived from the IT or information services stack and, uh, and the OSI model from back in the day. But what the sales stack really is, is it's, it is um, technology and automated tools that enable and empower salespeople to um, manage the buying and the selling process from start to end. So an example would be at the very start, or if we were to look at a funnel, at the very top of the funnel, we are, um, we're relying on marketing and demand generation efforts to basically drive brand new leads into the top of that funnel. Well, there are technologies that are available, like marketing automation technologies, a few that come to mind would be Marketo, or Eloqua uh, or Pardot. Those are marketing automation tools that would identify a lead uh, implicitly and explicitly and basically grade that lead A, B, or C based on that person's behavior on your website or if that person attended a webinar that your company hosted or saw you at an event or a trade show. And your marketing automation system identifies that lead scores it and then assigns it if you have a company that has a sales development team assigns it to the right sales development rep who is then responsible for picking up the phone and calling that lead back now fast forward to a company that has thousands or tens of thousands of leads coming into the top of the funnel that process must be efficient and must be very fast in not only scoring the leads and sorting them and filtering them but discerning quickly who to assign that lead to and then a sales development rep who may be responsible for following up on hundreds of leads in a given day, they need technology like a technology tool. I'm sorry, a telephony tool, like, for example, Connect and Sell, which allows them to pick up the phone and dial two, 300, 400 leads in a very short amount of time. And the technology only connects that sales rep with people who actually pick up the phone on the other side. And as you walk your way through the sales funnel, there's marketing automation for telephone, for email, for social media outreach, for the middle of a deal, uh, when the deal has seven stages of its life cycle. There are technologies and tools that allow uh, the efficiency and productivity of that funnel to take place. Uh, and that in, you know, is a long answer, but it does define what a sales stack is. So companies want to really start thinking about where do we need automation? Where do we need efficiency? Where do we need productivity gains? And that should drive where, uh, what technologies you uh, consider first for your for your sales stack. Awesome, thanks. Uh, let us know if you guys are following and uh, I guess what you think about what we're talking about at the same time. Um, just a sidebar, I just created a poll and um, we've got a lot of questions. So um, have a look at them and see which ones you want answered the most once we get through the stuff. Okay. okay, let's talk about owning your calendar and the mechanics of productive days, weeks, months, and quarters. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I want you to get rid of the myth that work happens on Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, that is over, um, especially for the A players out there that are doing very well in their career. It is a 24-7 world, uh, and technology allows us to live 24-7 and actually still get some rest and still get some free time and still be able to create space in our personal and professional lives. The better you can get at owning your calendar and owning time, uh, the better you're going to do in your career. So there's a lot of ways out there to do that, starting with whether you are an Outlook user or whether you use Gmail and use Google Calendar. You could visit YouTube, for example, and type in, tips, tricks, techniques for Outlook, or tips, tricks, techniques for Google Calendar. And you're going to learn a bevy of different shortcuts and fast 
ways to get through your calendar and really better organize your time. Uh, there are lots of, you know, there's a lot of methods and habits that you can create and disciplines that you can, uh, that you can execute on to own your calendar. Uh, the best sales development reps that have worked in my organizations take uh, what they call a bookends approach to the week. And what I mean by that is they actually have their weekends, but on Monday and on Friday, they actually see those days as the bookends of the week. And on Monday and Friday, those are the days when they can do a lot of administrative work. They could do follow-up from emails that came in last week or over the weekend or overnight. They can reach out uh, to internal stakeholders that they're working with that they might need help from throughout the week. A lot of team meetings take place on Mondays and Fridays. One-on-ones take place on those days. And essentially, they're using those days to prepare for the middle of the week, which is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And that is when sacred prospecting and lead follow-up time happens. And in my organizations, I would actually, as the leader of my team, communicate to all the executives and different business units in my department what Tuesday and Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday meant to sales development reps. Essentially, their blinders are on. They are very focused on lead follow-up and lead generation. Please do not schedule them for meetings. Please do not walk by their desk and tap on their shoulder and ask them if they'd like to have a cup of coffee with you or walk around the block. Again, it's sacred time that can happen on Monday and Friday. And that's a super effective approach uh, to your calendar. A third one that you can consider is from a great speaker named Brendan Bouchard. And he spells his name B-R-E-N-D-O-N-B-U-R-S-H-A-R-D. A few years ago, he created what's called a one-page productivity planner. And on that one page, which you can download for free as a PDF, he has at the very top of the page, the three most critical projects that you need to work on either today, this week, or in this quarter. Uh, Beneath that, he has people, people that you need to hear from, as well as people that must hear from you in a given time frame. And then finally, at the bottom of the page, he has three priorities. What are the top three priorities that must get done or must get addressed right now? So again, it's projects, it's people, it's priorities. It's approaching your calendar or your week with a bookends approach. And uh, then you could do what the CEO of a company called Zappos does. Uh, Tony Shea is his name. He's actually... He has succumbed to the fact that he gets so many emails in one given day that he can't look at them until the following day. So he actually takes all the emails from one day and he puts it in what he calls his yester box. And then the next morning, he filters through all the emails he got uh, the day before because he's got a finite amount of emails. He knows how many he has and how much time it's going to take for him to get through, prioritize, and obviously follow up on. So those are just some some techniques that you might want to apply right after this webinar. And uh, you're going to find um, your efficiency and productivity in your own life is going to, it's going to increase exponentially without question. I think that's pretty amazing. So what sort of time have you been able to gain back from, um, or how, how much has your sales increased or like whatever metric you want to use as a result of using some of these methodologies? Absolutely. So when you pair up the methodology, Sean, uh, with good technology from the stack that you are building, uh, you're going to find, especially in the sales development effort, people are getting up or getting after leads in record time. And for those in my world in sales development and in marketing and in demand generation, the value of leads depreciates by the minute. So the faster you can have your sales development reps responding to inquiries about your offering, the higher the probability is that you're going to convert those into real viable opportunities for your pipeline. Uh, So uh, in terms of metrics, The number of booked meetings has increased 2x. The number of completed meetings that actually convert to revenue pipeline has completed because the um, the, the sales development reps have the focus. And if they're taking the bookends approach, for example, on Monday and on Friday, they're thoroughly researching who it is they're going to be following up with and who there is they're going to be pursuing on in a prospecting effort. So when that C-level executive or when that key call point that you're trying to reach actually picks up the phone and answers your phone call, you actually have a talk track and you're prepared to have a very warm 
conversation that's engaging and is really about them because you've really taken the time and you've leveraged your calendar to learn about their world. Uh, and some of the biggest, most fundamental mistakes that salespeople make is they talk about themselves. They talk about their company, their history, their offering, which is uh, interesting to them, but it's really not ever interesting to your customer. You need to be talking about what's going on in the customer's world. And the better you could do that, uh, you know, the better everything's going to be for everyone. That's really interesting. I think the same goes for speaking, right? So yesterday, a really small example, or actually, I guess my interviews with, with people like you are, are a good example. So I guess as a sidebar, every time I do an interview with a speaker or, or a thought leader um, for video production, which is one-on-one, -on -one, I know everything about the other person. And so I go in and I'm like, hey, you know, I know that you have a daughter and a dog. How are they doing? I know that you worked here, but you actually studied uh, philanthropy, not philanthropy, you, uh, philosophy. At sure. university and sure. why did you um go to nepal for three years and what were you doing there and then they're like wow you know so much about me and then you start asking all of these sort of diagonal questions i wouldn't go that personal with your sales calls but i guess the example there is like the more research you do and the more you know about them the more invested they are um which is a helpful tip sorry you go <laughs> oh, i'm sorry sean i was just gonna i was gonna add to what you were saying to say which goes right back to what we uh we're talking about with brand uh, you know, if you are reluctant, for example, to build out a social media profile, be it on Twitter or on LinkedIn or Snapchat, think twice about where your prospects live. And if they live on those social media channels, then you too should live there. Uh, and then you can catch the conversations that they're having and you can um, catch the insights and intel that they're really giving you through their social media posts. So if they're talking only about business and their marketplace, there's a lot of gold nuggets there that you could pull from and start your conversations with. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so another thing that I've realized um, recently is that um, PwC does these strategy papers um, on most industries around the world. So if you need some sort of just like a, a high level overview of what's going on in your industry, if you are going into some of these meetings, sort of catching up on the last three years of those trends. So you go in and you're like, OK, this is my solution. But I know that over the last three years, you've had to change your business in these three ways. This is where the market's going. This is what you need. And this is your biggest challenge right now. Hmm. I guarantee you'll have a, a fundamentally different conversation because they're like, oh, you understand what my challenges are and you actually understand where the industry is going at the same time, um, which I think you, you will enable you to have a different conversation. So there's a great book uh, that was written many years ago from the late great uh, sales author, Chet Holmes. And the name of that book is The Ultimate Sales Machine. And um, what Chet talks about in that book is really leading with market data. Don't talk necessarily about uh, data in your world. Again, it's about them, not about you. And if you lead with market data, <clears throat> it's going to really resonate well with, with, for example, in a B2B world, with the business that you're, you're trying to engage. And then um, when you lead with market data like that and you have really good insights that are relevant to the business you're speaking to, a great conversation starter could be around their initiative. So we're getting into September of 2016 right now. And believe it or not, so many businesses who have a calendar fiscal year are preparing for 2017 already. So it's a great conversation starter to say, hey, I saw these three statistics in the market. In addition, I've spoken to five different companies who do similar work to what your company does. You don't necessarily have to name them, but I keep hearing the same issues coming up from these businesses. It's these three things. So with respect to your business, how big of an issue is it for your business and how would you stack rank it on your list of business issues? Oh, and by the way, since we too are planning for the next fiscal year, talk to me about where those rest on your list of initiatives for the fiscal year. What are you really trying to tackle first, second, and third? Uh, because I think it makes sense based on what we've learned about you, because we've been researching you and tracking you for some time. We think it might make sense to at least begin a conversation so that when it is a real issue for you and you are looking for offerings like ours, at least you give us an opportunity to have a seat at the table and have a real discussion about what we know about your marketplace. Awesome. That's great. Um, I put the link 
for that book in, oh, and the fabulous. PDF in the comments for anyone who wants to jump on that. Awesome. I think that's really great. Um, if you have any comments about what we're talking about, let us know, as always. Um, so I guess the last point before we get into some questions. So I guess this is probably the biggest issue, right? So how do you lead and develop an inspired team? And I guess sales can be very uninspiring. Like you're basically, you know, if you're, I'm going to, at some point I'll ask you how many questions and uh, follow up or how many calls and emails you should do to, until you get a meeting and then until you get a sale because there is a structure to that in the US. Um, I don't know what the, if you've seen any differences between Australia and the US, which you probably have. Sure, but, um, but motivating people is hard. So so um, let's give us some tips for, for leading an inspired team. Sure. So um, let's cut to the chase and get to the metrics part first. Um, so in a B2B world, depending on the size of your company, which there's so many variables now, uh, it's tough to just pinpoint an exact metric that is the, the formula for everyone because I don't think it exists. However, uh, your sales development reps, let's say they're managing a thousand accounts in a territory. There's probably three key people in every account that they could have a conversation with that's uh, relevant and valuable to your business. So at the very least, they should be doing 60 dials a day. And you figure they'll get just a portion of those dials to actually pick up the phone. So when you manage expectations that, look, you're going to make a lot of dials, you're going to send a lot of emails, no one is going to reply to you, at least for the most part, you're going to be told no, should you get someone on the phone, you have to manage the expectations about branding and avoiding obscurity up front so that Number one, you mitigate uh, the non-responsive uh, uh, feedback that you'll get from people. And when you do send an email to someone, if you're well known in your industry based on the articles you write, the videos you produce, the value you bring to the marketplace, people will probably recognize your name when it comes across their inbox. And they're going to be more. Uh, there's going to be a higher propensity of them to actually reply to you or at least look you up. When they look you up, they will likely Google your name. And more often than not, one of the first search results that comes up in Google is your LinkedIn profile. So when they go to visit your LinkedIn profile, is it a great storefront that shares your story and the story of your offering with the marketplace when visitors visit? Or do you not have a profile picture up yet? And it's instead a silhouette. No one wants to do business with a silhouette. So do all that upfront work to start attracting the marketplace to you versus pursuing the marketplace. And you're gonna have less and less days of all the calls with no one picking up the phone or no one replying to you. That's number one, right? Uh, did, um, did you have a question? Quickly, yeah. So um, I guess I did a poll. And so you've got about 60% of the audience is founders doing sales. And then you've got about 40% um, who have one to five people in their sales team. So I think um, with that in mind, and maybe we can go over this like kind of back through, um, and I guess as a founder and with a small sales team, like how do you really manage manage this process? So we're, let's talk about the mo motivation inspiration factor. If you as a founder of a business are not motivated or are not inspired, you certainly are not going to motivate or inspire others. So it's a great time to check your head and check yourself with respect to your own purpose and why it is that you are there. I have a wife that I've been married to for 20 beautiful years. Uh, she's the light of my life. We have three beautiful boys. I have a, a, a lot of nieces and nephews who are very important to me. I have a large organization that I am responsible for and that I need to continue to lead by example for. All of those factors inspire me on a daily basis and really give me a reason to come to work every day and just serve the organization that I am building and maintaining and help others. And when I come to work with that type of mindset, it's infectious and it rubs off on everybody to the point where they know that I'm inspired and that I'm trying to serve a purpose for them and for myself and in turn, they become inspired too, and they start to get in better touch with their purpose. And for those who oversee a smaller organization, this works in your favor. Please, please get to know your employees and get to know your team on an individual basis. The best way to begin this 
is to do it one-on-one -on -one, in a one-on-one, -on -one, not in a conference room, not with laptops up, looking at dashboards and numbers, go outside, take a walk around the building, get some fresh air. You will see that when both of you have oxygen, the guards start to come down and you have real human conversation with people. And in turn, you will find out what's really driving them on a daily basis. What are they aspiring to become when they are at work? And when the dark times hit, whether it's a bad day or if it's a rough week or no one is picking up the phone for an entire month, you have that purpose that you can remind them of because you know them and they know you and that rapport and credibility and trust is there. Remember that organizations run at the speed of trust. So you have to, as early as possible, build that trust level among all of your teammates. And it's going to be very easy to inspire them during the tough times and even during the good times. I'm getting excited. Right? I want to do push-ups right now. I'm so, <laughs> so fired up. But that's, it's really it's tried and tested. And uh, it's worked for me in many organizations because, you know, bad or good, I've led with my heart. And I really care about the people that I hire, that I recruit. And I uh, make sure that in the recruiting process, for example, I'm managing expectations very early. And having them talk to me about what is it about our company, our offering, our marketplace that really appeals to them so I can see and take a good litmus test on whether or not we have a viable candidate here. Um, would you encourage, um, I guess, founders um, to, because everyone has a different purpose and a different reason, right? So if you've got a sales team of maybe two to three and they each have a different purpose or a different love of the company or maybe it's the industry or something, would you inspire them to all share their purpose so that they can each remind each other? But also, like, you don't know what you don't know, right? So someone might have never looked at someone like someone else's purpose in the way that they did. So then they get even more inspired or they see it in a different direction. Have you seen that happen successfully before? Yes, I have. Uh, so I have seen it happen successfully. Uh, the company uh, that I worked for just prior to ServiceNow was called Achievers. And Achievers is a SaaS-based platform that focuses on driving employee engagement. And that really comes from helping employees identify what it is that gets them to work every day and encouraging them to share that. So of course, we're all different. And as you know, Sean, some people are very introverted and aren't comfortable sharing what their life purpose is per se. <laughs> uh, but others are the complete opposite, very extroverted, very passionate, no problem sharing it whatsoever. It's your responsibility as a leader to really identify and respect the style and approach of your team. And if they're introverted, for example, give them another opportunity to channel uh, what their passion is, whether it's taking 10% of their time in the work week to focus on something that matters most to them and contributes back to the community, for example. Uh, let them do that little project uh, aside from work. I know they do that at Salesforce. I think it's 1% of the time is spent doing something that kind of uh, and, uh, follows your passion. That, those are great tells and great scenarios where you're going to learn about people who aren't so comfortable sharing it out front, up front. Awesome. I think that's really, really great. Um, I think uh, if you guys don't have any more questions on that, I think we might um, dive into some of these questions. Um, there's a few of them. Um, starting off with, what are the best tools and techniques to streamline your sales strategy when you only have a small team? Uh, so I would start with uh, CRM. Doesn't matter what CRM platform you use. Uh, I'm assuming that you use the CRM system, but the best way is, for example, if you want to just outline a number of plays that you want to take against a different lead or a different account, if those are mapped in your CRM where most salespeople live, especially sales development people, then uh, more often than not, it's going to serve as a great roadmap or guide for that salesperson's conversation on the phone or knowing what steps to take next. Uh, often um, people miss the most fundamental steps and things slip through the cracks early on in the process and you end up losing a deal very late in the process when you should have lost kind of in the first round. So um, making sure that those steps and fundamentals and tips or techniques are, are really mapped within an environment that the salespeople live in. I feel like half of the people just got reset on Crowdcast or something because they all just like went to zero and then up again. That was really interesting. Um, well, let hopefully us know I'm not boring them too much. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it was a platform issue, maybe. Okay, um, let's start with, as a sales leader and professional, how do you build presence when there's so much noise? 
uh, that comes down to focus. That comes down to uh, a great, uh, a great, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a great acronym that's used by Tony Robbins and it's RPM. Oh, yeah. it's, it's identifying the results that everyone is after. It's beginning with the end in mind. And then it's talking about the purpose. Why are we trying to go after these results? And then it's taking massive action to get to that goal. Uh, and really thinking and acting a lot bigger towards that goal, um, that's a very easy way to become a signal in the noise is to just get focused on what the target is. Uh, and another analogy I'll share is what's uh, talked about by Simon Sinek, and it's the golden circle, really starting with the why and then going to the how and then going to the what. So if the entire organization knows why we're doing this and why we are uh, bringing our offering to the marketplace and why it helps customers, uh, then uh, everybody usually lines up pretty quickly and, and um, gets pretty excited about getting after the goal together. And then you have a collective effort. Finding these things online. Oh, yeah, yeah. By Tony Robbins and then Simon Sinek, The Golden Circle. That's right. That's right. I love that you could just share it right right here. And uh, forgive me for not having a slide deck to, to share it up front. Ralph actually has a really sore back, so we, we didn't want to cancel today because we wanted to serve you guys, but um, we're, we're, uh, we're, that's why we're, we're getting through this. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so uh, what are the three main skills you look for in a VP of sales? Ooh, uh, so business acumen would be number one. Um, and that come, that I think a subset of business acumen is really experience. Uh, this VP of sales would need to uh, have a proven track record, not only of successes, but of failures, because I'm going to be looking for the resilience and how they made it through those failures. Uh, so probably business acumen, experience, attitude is critical. It's really important to hire someone who walks into a room and brings light with them versus sucks the life out of the room. Uh, especially in a VP of sales role, they're going to be interacting and interfacing with your prospects and your customers, as well as your e-staff, your board members, your advisors. And it's really important that coupled with that business acumen and experience, they've got a fabulous attitude and um, uh, a forward a forward outlook towards things. Those are some, some key components I would look for. Awesome. I hope we answered your question. Good questions. <laughs> okay, next one. At what point should you transition from a founder-led sales to getting it um, in a sales or BD person? And then at what point do you then hire a VP of sales? Oh, that's a good one. Probably not the best question for me, but I would, um, I would, from my experience, I, I know in the startup world, there's basically milestones. You, when you first hit your first 1 million, your first 10 million, so on and so forth, that usually drives the behavior of the entire organization to the point where maybe the original founder of the company is no longer the CEO at some milestone. And instead you bring in uh, some more big guns, people who might be a lot more um, acquainted with bringing companies to the market and taking them public, et cetera. So they're just, you know, there are milestones that you as a founder and, you're, and you as a business need to identify first to know when you're gonna actually pivot or make a change as a, as a company. Um, I'm going to link you to a blog post. Um, I had Daniel Barber do a sales development chat, and uh, I think he spoke a bit on this. Um, he did. I watched it. Yeah, <laughs> da Daniel's fabulous. And uh, he's, is he from New Zealand, Sean? Or he's is he from, from Australia. Oh, he is? Okay. He is okay. very Australian. He, he is a, um, he's a revered sales VP in Silicon Valley, to say the least, let alone uh, the US. He, I believe he's at Node and um, has just done fabulous work in all the companies he's worked for from Responsus, which uh, was acquired by Oracle to Toutapp to now Node. Uh, he is a, he's, I'm glad you mentioned Daniel. He's a wonderful resource uh, to get a lot of value from and, and somebody who could better answer that question. Yeah, awesome. Um, and uh, because you're all on the call, Daniel is actually coming down to New Zealand um, with us. We haven't announced this yet, but um, we'll be our sales lead for our up and coming sales and marketing jam. So you heard it here take first. It, yeah, take advantage of that one. Yeah, it's going to be great. Okay, um, next questions. Um, hmm. I guess. Uh, I, I lost all my hair at age 25. I, you know, I know that's a question. 
I started with a full head of hair, but when you go 23 years in sales, sometimes you just, you can't keep it. You mean to be encouraging people. Yeah, too many ups and downs too. Um, I guess let's talk about um, the, the, um, the differences that you see between sales in Australia and, and the U.S., um, if you can, um, just a few examples. I know that, um, you know, the U S is a big market and, uh, we definitely struggle with it. It's, um, not really in our psyche, um, the whole like big sales, um, as Kiwis, but we're pretty similar to Australia. So I wonder if you have any sort of, um, nuances you've seen. Or yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we call, uh, in my organization, that's APJ, it's Asia Pacific, Japan, and it includes A and Z and, a and Z within APJ is the hottest market. Uh, I think it's really important to not worry so much about <clears throat> breaking into the US or breaking into Asia Pacific. Focus on New Zealand businesses. Focus on Australian businesses. The A and Z market is very hot. And I would liken it to uh, when we were talking about brand, Sean, a lot of people who have a presence or are building their presence on social media, they're so focused on gaining new followers, new followers, more followers. When you've got a, a, a group of existing followers already, make the best out of that group of followers. The same applies to the marketplace in New Zealand. Focus on the people who are in New Zealand and the businesses who are already in your backyard and learn to master the craft of serving them and serving them well, and the rest will happen on its own. Things will line up naturally if you're just focused on serving your customers and your prospects. So what do you do? So a lot of um, people will tell you that New Zealand, the New Zealand market is too small and that's why they wanna get offshore. Um, I guess, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so again, I would, I would look within and it comes back to the obscurity topic. I would really start to focus on attracting the audience that you want to attract as business partners. And it won't matter in the long run where those business partners are located in the world. But when you focus on making sure that you have an attractive offering and that you are sharing the stories of the value you're bringing to your existing client base and you're, for example, connecting the existing clients you have with the prospects that you'd like to do business with, all of a sudden the world starts to open up to you. So I would shift from pursuit to attraction. And I think a lot of things will change uh, for the better for you. Awesome. It's um, an awesome see. question. And how are we on time, Sean? Uh, we are doing good. I think I might ask one more question and then uh, we can jump off and, uh, yeah, sorry about the platform today, guys. I feel like we're having a few more tech issues. I keep noticing that the numbers keep refreshing here. So uh, we'll get that sorted with the um, Crowdcast team so um, that doesn't happen in the future. Um, I guess this is a good question. So how do you support the um, client journey through the sales process and then and then scale that? Oh, wonderful. So uh, prospects and clients are looking for answers. They're looking for trusted advisors. They're looking for experts and people who have expertise in the marketplace. Uh, they may not have the answers. So uh, again, when you're approaching the selling process, start to focus on the buying process. And a lot, a lot of times your potential customers don't know what they don't know. So the better you can show them the timeline of how long a process like this takes based on business you've done, uh, it's really going to enlighten them as to what's needed from them, who they need to uh, work with within their own organizations to kind of carry the ball across the line. But they won't know what to do if they've not purchased an offering like yours before. So the more you can educate them on what that process could look like uh, and, and see them as a partner in the process where they can make ads, moves, and changes to the process – uh, you'll be just fine. You'll be fine if you can lay out that path for them and and let them contribute to uh, the shaping of that path. And more often than not, when you do that, you'll expedite the process altogether. Uh, things can happen a lot faster so that you can start working together as businesses and you can start building what both of you, I hope, uh, want to be a long-lasting business relationship. Awesome. Great answer. Okay. Last question. Um, sure. And I think this is pretty relevant for Kiwis. Um, so this one, 
So what are good practices for getting good outcomes out of trade shows and events? Um, a lot of our Kiwi businesses come up to trade shows and events. I guess we've mentioned that, you know, uh, conferences like Sales Hacker, Sasta are really good. And those companies, especially that company, companies like Sales Loft, just have this amazingly epic process for converting leads, for talking uh -huh. to people. So I guess for Kiwis, how do they stand out? Um, I guess we could do it from two two things. So most won't buy a stand because they can't afford it or they don't want to spend the money on it. So how mm. do you convert with, the, with with just being there? And then also how do you convert if you have a stand or you are at the trade show doing it properly? Sure. So um, think about doing a lot of preemptive work. Uh, you know, uh, what you need to do is get good at building anticipation for the event. So the more you can share with your community, and with your audience that you're going to be present at the event, oh, and look forward to A, B, C, or D, uh, you'll excite people and people will want to see you and they'll look forward to, uh, to talking with you and your business. A great way that a lot of people don't take advantage of is video. Uh, you know, we all, have, most of us have mobile devices like this where we can make a pretty good high definition, high quality audio and video that lasts maybe 20 seconds. Go ahead and make that video about how exciting it's going to be at the event in two weeks and blast it out to your network. Ask your, your, um, your network to share it with others, especially those that you really trust and know are, are going to be helping you out or willing to help you out and get that seen and heard by your audience and by your marketplace. At the event itself, uh, what's really important is that you look at people, listen to them, and get enough intel and insights from them in your conversation to warm up the future conversation after the event. Uh, as I mentioned, for the preemptive, event, if you are uh, going to attend an event and you're not necessarily going to have a booth there, but you know a lot of your prospects are going to be there, try to book a meeting for just after the event, before the event. Sean, it's Ralph. I'm going to be at the event next Thursday. Hey, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on how the event went. I know that these three speakers are gonna be talking about these three topics. Why don't we talk the following day at 9 a.m. for 15 minutes so I can get your thoughts. And when you can secure a meeting like that, you're gonna get more than 15 minutes if you're adding value and having a really warm conversation about how the event went. So those are some things to keep in mind. On my LinkedIn profile, I actually put a post probably three months ago uh, that, was, that came out of frustration where I spoke at a company's event. I was one of the speakers on stage. And two days later, uh, someone from the event who, who attended, um, they reached out to me with basically no intel or information and no understanding that I was actually not only at the event, but I was a speaker. So they led with, with some coldness to say the least. And it just inspired me to write a good post on LinkedIn about how to effectively follow up after, after a conference or after an event. So hopefully the audience here might want to check it out and, and uh, can pick up some pretty good tips from it. In the comments if you want to read it. Okay. Oh, cool. cool. Thank you. Um, well, this was really fun. I hope you guys um, enjoyed it and, and learned um, as much as I did. Um, thank you so much for coming, especially because you're in pain. Um, and um, yeah, this was really fun. So um, we'll write a post about it. The recap will be available um, at the end of this. And if you um, would please fill out my survey, it's five questions. I've reduced it because I know how much you like filling them out. And uh, we'll keep doing fun stuff like this. So um, any last words from you, Ralph? Uh, well, I look forward to visiting New Zealand. I plan to be there in 2017, and I'm really looking forward to seeing a live All Blacks game. I played rugby at university. I've been a fan of the All Blacks for a long time. I actually uh, featured them in one of my recent articles on Sales Hacker on taking massive action, so you could check that out as well. But I really look forward to seeing them play live. So uh, looking forward to meeting a lot of you, too, while I'm there. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, guys. See you later. Thank you, Sean. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers.